Good evening. Welcome back to the Johnson Space Center for today's post-landing news conference following the landing of Endeavour to wrap up STS-89. With us today to talk about the landing and related events are Tommy Holloway, NASA's Space Shuttle Program Manager, Frank Culbertson, NASA's Phase One Shuttle Mirror Program Director, and John Shannon, the Entry Flight Director for today's landing. And we'll start with Tommy. Uh, thank you very much. <coughs> uh, we j have just completed a eighth uh, docking flight to the Mir, and I'll let Frank talk about the details of that. Uh, as you know, everything went uh, very well. Frank can tell you more about that later. This was also the first flight of 105 after the major mod period where we prepared her for the, for the space, space station era and made a number of significant changes, putting our airlock external uh, docking mechanism in, uh, uh, lightening uh, her some 2,000 pounds. And uh, she, she performed flawlessly uh, on this flight, a great tribute to the people in California that made the modifications and the people down in Florida who processed it, uh, 105. Um, the flight was executed flawlessly as, uh, as has become routine uh, of recent years and uh, everyone did a great job, both the people who prepared for the flight, uh, the people who did the training of the flight crew, the flight crew executed the flight well and of course John and his colleagues in the Mission Control Center did an outstanding job, as did the Phase One program. It seems a very short time ago that we uh, went to Moscow and, and talked about the possibility of doing a docking mission on, on, the, on the station, and now we're on the last le leg of completing a program that I think will go a great deal toward uh, preparing us to do the International Space Station. Uh, Frank can, can tell you more about that, uh, but uh, I, I believe we are indeed have accomplished and, and will accomplish our objectives of, of uh, pave, paving the way for the space station with the Phase One program. Uh, on this landing, it's the 13th time, uh, landing at Kennedy in a row and some 20 out of 21. Uh, uh, so uh, John and his colleagues are, are learning how to deal with with the weather and and uh, and get us into Kennedy on a routine uh, manner. So I would like to take this opportunity to send my congratulations to the entire shuttle team and the Phase uh, One team for a job well done. Frank, thank you very much, Tommy, and uh, congratulations to you and the shuttle program also for continuing to demonstrate how flexible and capable the shuttle is. It's been a uh, real joy to watch, and, uh, and John, also my congratulations to the entry team for an excellent uh, re-entry and landing. And of course to the crew on the shuttle and the crew on board the Mir for the way they executed the, uh, the joint mission. We transferred almost five tons of equipment in both directions, and uh, everything went extremely well. We worked some problems in some of the payloads and were able to solve all but one of them and get data out of uh, both the payloads on the shuttle and the payloads that were transferred to the Mir. So, Andy's off to a good start. Uh, he just welcomed the new crew that arrived earlier today on board the Soyuz when it docked with the Mir about 12.15 Central Time, actually a little early at about noon. And uh, <clears throat> Talgut Musabayev and Nikolai Bodarin, uh, Leopold Iharts are all on board now. So we have a crew of six on board the Mir. Uh, systems are working very well. The docking was executed uh, automatically and flawlessly with using the core system and uh, they've actually uh, repaired the CO2 removal system that had a slight fan problem and uh, replaced a vacuum valve, so they're up to full strength on that. So they're getting ready to execute the, the French program. Andy is already into executing his U.S. science program, and the crew continues to uh, function very well together, as does the ground team in Moscow. So we're very pleased with that. Um, through the miracles of uh, modern technology, I was able to co communicate with Dave Wolf just a little while ago, shortly after his landing, and uh, Dave sounded great. He's very happy to be home. He wanted me to tell everyone that this was the greatest adventure of his life. He's very glad he did it, and uh, he also said that uh, he couldn't imagine attempting ISS without the Phase One experience, and he's ready to share those experiences and to, to begin work in, in preparation for and, and uh, helping people get ready for ISS. He just wants about three or four days off. But uh, he's in good spirits and, and uh, getting ready to go through all the medical tests that we uh, subject our folks to after landing and, 
And of course, uh, Dave, being a doctor, understands those very well and is, is ready to, uh, to get down to work on that. We'll be welcoming them back to Houston tomorrow evening, uh, probably between 5 and 6, depending on the weather. And there'll be more word of that available from the uh, public affairs here at uh, Johnson Space Center. But uh, Dave has done a terrific job. Andy's uh, well on the way to a good mission. And I think one of the things that we continue to, to prove here is that uh, all of our space operations are intertwined now, that uh, the successes of all our vehicles, the capabilities of all our vehicles are related. And it's always good to see good things happen like the Soyuz docking and the shuttle landing and to see it happen so well, executed so well and happen on time. <clears throat> so again, my hat's off to the team. It's a real pleasure working with everybody on both the U.S. and the Russian side at uh, Johnson Space, Space Center, Kennedy, and all the other centers that support us and the folks in Moscow and the rest of Russia. So again, thanks, and John, well done. Thanks, Frank. Uh, we can uh, talk about the entry. At, I'll echo what, uh, what Tommy and Frank said. It was a, a very nice ending to a very successful flight. As brief yesterday, uh, we did just bring up Kennedy Space Center today. The weather forecast looked like it would support today. And uh, sure enough, the weather guys were right on the money again. And, uh, and we came home the first rev, uh, caught our lit opportunity into a Kennedy Space Center. This morning when the crew ran through the uh, deorbit preparations, the final payload deactivations, uh, everything was extremely smooth. I'd like to echo Tommy's words about uh, the super job that the, uh, the folks down at Kennedy that process these orbiters have done. Uh, there were almost no anomalies on this flight, and those that we did have were, were very, very minor. Uh, so we pressed through the deorbit prep time frame. The crew was well ahead of their timeline the entire time. Uh, there were no issues to speak of at all. The, uh, the weather was beautiful. I think everybody that saw the landing was, uh, was uh, uh, very, uh, very happy with the, the way it all looked all the way through the count. The only issue that, uh, that we worked at all, there was a, a jet stream carrying over central Florida which had some, some fairly high winds across uh, where the shuttle makes its turn to line up with the runway. Uh, we did talk to the commander about that a little bit. Um, uh, we wanted to get some data from the, uh, the shuttle training aircraft that uh, King Cockrell was flying. He flew those approaches for us, that, what the different options uh, that we had, and uh, told us that uh, the winds were really not a, an issue at all. It was very smooth with no turbulence. Uh, so we went with the pre-flight plan and did an overhead uh, approach to the 1-5 uh, the into the runway. And, uh, and as you saw, the commander flew it extremely well and uh, we touched down right on the money. So it was really a no issues landing at all and, uh, and just a, a beautiful, uh, beautiful end to a great flight. Well, thanks, John. We'll take questions here in Houston before going down to the Cape and we'll start with Mark. Uh, thanks, Mark Caro from the Houston Chronicle for Tommy Holloway. Wonder if you could look ahead at least through the fiscal year and maybe the calendar year and sketch out what missions you're planning now and what months they'll, you plan to launch them? Well, Mark, right now we're, we're I'll tell you what we know uh, <clears throat> as best I can remember it. Uh, of course, right now we're planning on uh, launching uh, a, uh, a space lab mission on, in um, April, April the 2nd, and then another mirror mission for Frank on the uh, 29th of May. And, um, and then uh, STS-88, the first uh, uh, station flight is, is scheduled in July, July the 8th, 7th, 9th. And, um, and ACCEF had been scheduled <clears throat> in, in August, but as, as you know, um, that uh, payload has had some development problems and, and has slipped uh, is not going to be able to make that launch date. Uh, <clears throat> they are, they have a review next week and will determine what the, their possibilities are in the future. And then, uh, uh, so it will have to slip uh, somewhere in the future and, and we uh, have, have yet to deal with that until we know what, what the possibilities are and what, when it could possibly be ready and, and uh, we think uh, we uh, need to get a little closer to, to the space station schedule to understand it uh, and, and what the, the possibilities are to fly XF along with the space station. Our current plans would, would be to fly 95 in uh, October, October the 29th, and, and then another space station flight, 96, um, on December the 2nd. And um, so I expect that uh, 
that uh, the overall schedule of uh, will for the next uh, through the end of this year and into the first part of next year will come into focus uh, toward the end of March or first of April as we see how all of these elements are coming together. And I have a follow-up question. I don't know whether it's for uh, Frank Halbertson or you, Mr. Holloway, but uh, there were a number of space officials meeting in Washington this week to discuss the space station. I wonder if there's been any further talks about additional shuttle missions to Mir, uh, any developments in the last days that you could speak to? I'll let, <clears throat> I'll let Frank. Uh, there's been no further discussion, and we've had no proposals from the Russians. Uh, I don't believe it was... Uh, certainly not formally addressed, and I don't know even if they informally addressed it in Washington, uh, but there really is no place in the schedule right now to put an additional flight to the Mir for logistics support, and we certainly don't have an American in training for an additional increment, so that's still uh, where it is. Okay, we'll take questions now down at the Kennedy Space Center. This is Seth Borenstein from the Orlando Sentinel. For Tommy, first, um, we're uh, in following up on Mark's questions. Uh, we keep hearing that uh, because of the Russian problem that uh, the first two elements of space station may slip a month or so. Um, you mentioned it in July, which is I guess when it's been scheduled. Is there talk of pushing it back to August since AXAF won't be in August? And how serious is that talk? Well, certainly AXAF uh, slipping out uh, provides the opportunity for us to fly the first station element uh, in August or September. Uh, so I think we have a wide range of, of uh, flexibility in terms of, of uh, when to fly the first element and, uh, I, and as, again, as I said earlier, I believe uh, a little later in this year, uh, the total status of the station in terms of how the elements are coming together and, and when, uh, when the uh, FGB will actually be launched and when uh, the service module status is, I think the whole thing will come together better in a couple of months and we'll be able to, to do what we think is, is the right thing to, for the overall health of both programs. Okay, and to follow up, Tommy, um, looking at uh, the, you've just had the review by uh, Fred Gregory on the layoffs here and, and there on U the USA layoffs. They mentioned that, well, it's um, conceivable it should be able to fly safely this year with a very reduced manifest. They have said the USA hasn't proven how they could fly safely with the increased manifest in FY99. Are you at all concerned that you can make the manifest of, uh, I guess it would be eight or even nine flights in 99 if you push AXAF to next year? Am I at all concerned? Of course I'm concerned. I, I spend about 60 hours a week uh, being concerned. Uh, that's that's uh, what I do for a living. Uh, on the other hand, I, I reviewed uh, the USA proposal in terms of how they would manage their manpower in light of the fact that we have five flights this year. And in context of the overall budget structure in which uh, we face in the, in the out years and, and we was satisfied that it was a good proposal and uh, I'm very confident uh, that uh, the space shuttle team will be able to, to adjust to, to the manpower reductions and, and uh, be even stronger in, in the long haul. And, of course, uh, overall, uh, yeah, this this manpower reduction has to, has to be taken in context of, of where the shuttle program is is going in terms of its cost structure, and and where it's come from. Um, for example, over the last uh, last five years, the shuttle team's done an extraordinary job of reducing cost while maintaining and, and improving the quality and safety of, of flying shuttles. The, for example, the contractor workforce down in Florida that processes vehicles in 1991 had 7,500 people and uh, was working 10% overtime, uh, flying eight flights a year. Last year, with 5,000 people and 4% overtime, we flew eight flights. And uh, during that same period, we had one-third the problems that we had in 1991. So. Uh, we have a record of, of being able to, to reduce cost and, and improve quality and safety. 
I also believe that the space shuttle team is, is the best team in the world, uh, staffed by dedicated and committed people to, to go uh, get the job done. So uh, in, in that sense, uh, I really have a great deal of confidence that we'll be able to deal with, uh, with, with what faces us in, in a routine fashion. However, even though these costs have come down over the years, uh, the cost of operating the shuttle still is extremely high. Uh, for example, if we flew seven flights a year with today's budget plus institutional cost, each one of these flights costs us over $500 million. So for the long range vi vitality and health and perhaps the survival of the of the shuttle program, it's necessary to reduce cost uh, and maintain uh, the, the safety and, and perhaps even increase it as we become more productive and efficient in how we do business. Uh, so I reviewed all of this back in uh, November and December. I think the last review I conducted was December the 14th and I'm quite satisfied that the shuttle team will be able to, to respond to these uh, reductions and, and deal with them in due course. And uh, it's, this is not a subject that I, I will stay awake at night over. Uh, following up a little on Mark Rowe's question, I can see the benefits uh, to uh, Russia for an additional um, shuttle mirror. They'd get additional logistics uh, cargo back and forth. But uh, how would the U.S. benefit and uh, would it even be feasible this late to consider sending another long-term American up to Mir, given the fact there's nobody in training and um, no science program in place uh, for additional uh, follow-on flights? Uh, like I said before, Phil, there are no flights planned or, or currently being actively discussed uh, beyond the uh, you know low-level discussions from some of the Russians who would like to, to see more flights, but uh, there are no agreements, and so there's no way to answer your question. P. Call Terry with the West Kentucky News. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, one for the flight, the entry flight director. Uh, have you seen uh, this kind of a, uh, a wind uh, profile uh, before for uh, any other shuttles? Yeah, it's uh, it's not uncommon in the winter months for the jet stream to uh, to dip down around Florida. We uh, we had a lot of discussion on that on console if we were going to be outside of our historical database. Turned out we were not. We've had several flights in the past where we have. Um, have uh, had winds of this magnitude, uh, but as always, we just wanted to make sure that uh, we were doing the right thing, and that's why we had the shuttle training aircraft go look at it. Okay, and the last one for Frank. Um, Tommy mentions how he spends all his time being concerned, and at one point seemed like you were in front of Congress more than doing your uh, regular job, I guess. Now with the shuttle flight, shuttle mirror flights all but finished, uh, how do you feel about not having to spend your time politically fighting uh, Congress? Well, you know, part of our job is to do whatever is necessary to explain to the American public w what we're doing and why. And if it requires explaining it to Congress, then we'll do that. Uh, they are our oversight and uh, should understand what we're doing. And if it takes a hearing to understand that, then we'll do it. Um, as, as far as, as the program being where it is, uh, we still have an American on orbit. We still have another mission to plan and fly, and uh, nobody's settling down from anything. We are still going to remain just as intense as we have been on ensuring his safety, uh, ensuring that we're ready to go with the next mission, and, and uh, keeping the program at the same level of attention to, to detail and uh, care and feeding of all our people that are involved. And to uh, answer maybe Phil's question just a little bit better, the one he asked before, um, the, the only way that I think anybody on the U.S. side would consider any additional flights to the Mir would be if it were associated with the uh, deorbit of the Mir itself and ending the mission. And uh, that type of approach uh, we might be able to, to have some kind of discussions on and, and come up with some kind of joint plan, but that's really the only thing that I think would be considered by anybody. Okay, that's all the questions down at the Kennedy Space Center. Any follow-ups here? Seeing none, just one programming note. Kennedy Space Center will send a camera crew into crew quarters later tonight uh, for a brief uh, question and answer uh, opportunity with Dave Wolf, uh, according uh, to the approval of his flight surgeons down there. Uh, we expect that to occur no earlier than 11 p.m. Central Time, midnight Eastern Time. Keep watching NASA TV. The Kennedy Space Center will keep you posted with a slate on the screen. Thanks uh, for watching STS 89.